didn't catch my name earlier. I'm administrator with DHCD, and um, I will be monitoring today's success story presentation on air properties in York County. We will be taking questions for our speaker today at the end of his presentation, um, but feel free to type in your questions in the chat as you think of them. And you can also raise your hand at the end of the presentation by clicking on the raise button. Um, I know we're all very excited to hear from our guest speaker, Andy Frank of the Getty Harris Frank Hickman Law Firm in Williamsburg. He received his law degree from William and Mary and his many practice areas include real estate and estate planning. He is a board, also a board member of Housing Partnerships in Williamsburg. He has been working with Abbott Woodall and Jan Marshall in York County to clear cloudy titles of properties with multiple heirs, as well as providing estate planning services to their housing rehab clients. I'm really looking forward to hearing what he's going to share with us today, and we're very grateful he's joining us today. Uh, please join me in welcoming Andy Frank. Thank you, Jenna. I appreciate the introduction. And um, I've had a uh, good experience working with the team over there at York County on some of the airship issues that we've encountered. Um, you know, everyone is unique and uh, and usually when we put our minds to it and do a little bit of research, we're able to resolve most of them. Um, when we talk about airship issues, I think it's important to understand that um, not every uh, fractional interest or multiple owner property is an issue. Um, you know, a lot of times folks will intentionally plan to have multiple family members own the property. Maybe they have several children and they want them all to co-own the property and that's very much their intent and, and it works out. Um, what I'm planning to talk about today, though, are what I would think of as unintended airship issues, where over the course of time, uh, the interests in property get fractioned off and it becomes more difficult for the family to uh, make productive use of the property because of that, um, not because it was necessarily planned that way, um, but because uh, through inaction or failure to plan, this is what happened over generation after generation. Um, and so to uh, just to illustrate the point, um, what we see sometimes is that through the course of generations, uh, family property will pass down. And when you have multiple people taking interests over multiple generations, those interests can get smaller and smaller over time. Uh, so just for example, um, if you had a, a father that um, had no will, um, had no trust or any kind of estate planning, and he passed away and he had four children, each of them would inherit a one quarter interest in his property. And uh, at that, that time, uh, there would be four owners. Um, and then in the next generation, if you imagine each of those four people had uh, three children each um, after they each passed away, um, there may be 12 owners to the property and uh, so on and so forth over time. Um, some of the problems that we see with airship property um, of this nature is that it can be difficult to accomplish something um, when, when one or more of the people want to do it. And, and by that, I mean, just give an example, if one person thinks it's time to sell the family property, um, or even if most of the people think it's time to sell the family property, they can effectively be stymied in that effort if, uh, if just one of their co-owners um, uh, decides that they don't want to participate in that sale because uh, most buyers on an open market are going to expect that they get 100% of the ownership of the property. And so if there's a missing 5%, uh, they may be unwilling to engage in that. And that can be very frustrating for the people that do want to engage in the transaction. Um, similarly, and maybe more on point to the work we've done at York County is in order to mortgage a property, uh, generally you're going to want to have all of the owners of the property execute the mortgage, uh, the deed of trust document. And, um, that can be uh, very important if you're trying to uh, establish a loan or a grant um, for a rehab project 
um, or just a, a, a traditional mortgage if, if they need, if the family wants to try to um, get some money from financing that they can use to, uh, to repair the property or to do upgrades. Um, that can be stymied as well by the holdouts or the folks that won't participate. Um, airship issues can also give rise to disputes over um, rights of occupancy. Um, you know, if a person that owns 10% of the property, 10% interest in a property decides that they want to make it their home, and another person owns an 80% interest, then there may be a dispute between them over you know, who, who's entitled to do what with it. Um, you can also have disagreements or um, over the payment of expenses associated with the property, such as real estate taxes or insurance or maintenance costs, or um, not just disputes, but you may see that those things aren't done. Um, uh, when people have a very small interest in a property, they may feel like it's not worth their time or effort or money to contribute. And so if you have property that's gotten so fractioned down that nobody owns more than say three or four or five percent in it, no one might be very inclined to pay the real estate taxes or to ensure that it gets uh, maintains insurance or that it's properly maintained. And that property may deteriorate or um, you know, in a, in a negative scenario, if the taxes aren't paid, it, it may be um, that the, the government will exercise tax sale and that would, uh, the property may ultimately be lost. Um, so those are some of the kinds of issues that we encounter with airship property. Um, they're not always obvious um, when you talk with people about their property. I've had any number of situations where I'll talk with someone um, about their property and they'll identify it that way. They'll say, um, I need to take care of something for my house. And as you get more into the details of the conversation, um, sometimes you'll, you'll start to understand that it's not entirely that person's house. So uh, a common example that I'll hear is that I'll have uh, someone that comes in that says, I need to get a deed to my house. And what they mean by that is, that they are just a co-owner and they're looking to establish titles solely in their own name. And oftentimes, uh, especially if it's been multiple generations since, the, um, uh, since there was a, a single owner of the property or a single family member that owned it, what we see is that folks don't always even know, um, you know who the other co-owners are because perhaps they came from a different family line or they're more remotely related. Um, and in those situations, um, it's, it's not even necessarily clear who owns the property. Um, so one of the things that we're often tasked with early on in these projects is to determine, uh, at least as much as we can, about who the owners are and to give us an idea of what the scope of the issues are. And there's a couple um, uh, basic ways that we approach that. Um, one, uh, one starting point is usually to have a title examination done or to conduct one ourselves. Um, title examinations um, are reviewing what's on record at the courthouse um, for where this property is located. And there's two sets of records that are usually relevant. There are land records, um, which is where all deeds are recorded um, that would show where somebody had conveyed an interest if that happened. Um, and then there's also will and probate records, um, which may have records of people who have passed away and identify whether or not they had a will or um, if they didn't or if they didn't have a will um, and if they in whom their heirs are. Um, and so uh, that's a, a trip to the courthouse may be in, in order to do some investigating. Um, oftentimes we'll find that not all of the information we need is available in the courthouse. Um, for example, we may find that um, a certain person owned property and the family members are telling us, oh, he died a long time ago. Um, but we're finding no record of his death at the courthouse search um, because nobody took the initiative when he passed away to take care of that. And that's, that may be part of the problem. 
So our research may need to expand into some of the more um, uh, other methods to determine heirship or ancestry. Um, you know, a lot of people do family ancestry research of their own volition, and uh, and there's other uh, you know there's other records that can be examined, and it may involve interviewing or, or contacting family members who may know more um, about the particular person that passed away to see if we can find out when did that person pass away and who were their family members at the time and where did they live? And that may help us find um, a different, different source of information such as uh, being able to track down a death certificate um, if a family member has one or if it's sufficiently long ago to be able to get one from the D Department of Vital Records. Um, so, those are uh, some of the means that we use to try to determine the scope of what's going on. Um, once we've figured out what the status of the property is, um, if we can figure out what the status of the property is, there are some different things we can do to help clear up the title. So to go back to my earlier example, where somebody had passed away, um, but there's no record of their death or how their ownership of the property changed, um, there are certain things that we may be able to do once we've gathered the necessary information. Um, so, for example, uh, if a person had passed away and they owned some land, um, but there's no record of his death in the land records, but we find out that he actually had a will um, and nobody had ever probated that, we could work with the family to get his will probated. And what that, that involves putting the will to record at the courthouse. And once that's done, it creates a record of the change of ownership. Um, who, who became the owners of the property after he died? Um, because his will dictates whom that is. Um, so that's one way that we could confirm the title um, that's not completely clear in the land records. Another way we could do it is to file what's called a real estate affidavit. And these apply when a person dies intestate. And so the word intestate means that they died without a will. Um, it's the opposite of testate, which means a person died with a will. And when a person dies intestate without a will, there is essentially a, a course of inheritance that the, the Code of Virginia establishes their estate plan for them. Um, it's called intestate succession, and um, the way it works is that the, the law establishes based on familial relationship who is going to inherit from that person. Those laws have changed over time. Um, so a person that passed away in the 1940s may have had different heirs of intestate succession than a person that passed away in 2010. Uh, so we have to be conscious of when they passed away to determine what, what law governed who inherited from them at that time. But by and large, the law of intestate succession is um, what I think most people would think of as a natural course of succession. So if a person is married and they have children only with that spouse whom they're married to, then their spouse is, under current law, their spouse is going to inherit from them. Um, if that person is unmarried and they have children or descendants, it's the, the property is going to pass to their children um, or their uh, more remote descendants, grandchildren or great-grandchildren. And so the way that a real estate affidavit works is if we've done our research and we determined that that person who owned the property and died um, was... Uh, did not have a will, meaning that he was intestate, then a family member who is an heir or has an interest in the property may sign an affidavit that states when that person died and who his heirs at law were, meaning the people that inherited from him. And that real estate affidavit may be filed um, or recorded in the court records. And by doing so, it will create a, a link in the chain that shows who became the owner of that property or that property interest when this particular person died. Um, 
other things that is not terribly common that we encounter, but sometimes we'll find that a person actually signed a deed to convey their property to a family member or to someone else, but that they never actually recorded it in the land records. And so it doesn't show up in our title search um, because nobody ever took the trouble to put that deed in the land records. And if we're able to find that original deed, maybe in the person's files or amongst his other papers, then that deed, even if it may be 10 or 20 or 30 years old, may still be recorded in the land records um, to confirm the chain of title. And of course, whomever the deed was made out to be, had become the owner of the property. And by recording it in the land records, we've established that of record, so to speak. Um, there are some situations uh, where we simply cannot find all the information we need in order to establish title, like uh, for example, it just may be too uncertain. Uh, a person may believe to be dead, um, but it's too uncertain, or we don't know enough about who their heirs were to properly identify them. And in those kind of situations, if a person conducts due diligence and attempt makes a good faith effort to find out who other owners of the property are or to determine what the facts of the situation are and is unable to, they may be able to bring what's called a quiet title action. And that is a court case where um, they basically file a, a complaint with the court that establishes what they believe to be the case, what they believe the title to be and identifying the potential um, missing pieces, if you will, or the, the information that's absent. And the, that kind of court case would be served on known people who have an interest in the property, and it may be published with respect to unknown people with, that may have an interest in the property so that um, anyone has an opportunity to appear and to make their claim against the property. But at the end um, of a court case like that, the, the end result would ideally be that the court signs an order, the judge signs an order that establishes who the owners of the property are. So that's not an ideal way for us to, um, to have to clear title or to resolve title because anytime you're involved in a court case, it's going to take quite a bit more time and likely quite a bit more money than these other voluntary type procedures, but it is there as a fallback um, if all else fails. Um, when we're confronted with fractional interest property, um, one of the uh, things that we sometimes will encourage people to do is to see if folks are willing to participate in a way that um, allows either the goal that they're trying to accomplish to be done, or um, if some folks may be willing to give up their interest in the property and thereby consolidate somewhat what had been fractioned over time. Um, so to that first point, uh, you know, using the example, like let's say that we want to do a rehabilitation project on a piece of property and we find we've done all of our research and we've checked, we've had a title search done, we figured out who the heirs are, when needed, we recorded the real estate affidavits to clear, clear up the chain of title. So we know who the people are, we know who own it, um, but uh, we, we, need, we still want to accomplish something and say there's eight or 10 owners of the property. Um, if all of those people are willing to participate, um, then we can accomplish our goal. It may be uh, for our rehab project, uh, we might just need to get 10 different people to sign our deed of trust to confirm the mortgage. Um, if, it's, uh, if it's to the family now wants to sell the property, if everybody agrees and they say, okay, well, I'd be happy to get a little bit of money out of this instead of, um, you know, instead of just continuing to own a fractional interest in the property. If they're all willing, uh, all eight or 10 people are willing to sign a contract and to sign a deed to sell the property, there's nothing wrong with that. Um, and in fact, that can be an ideal way to resolve it because um, while it's maybe logistically difficult to engage all those people, if they're all willing and able and motivated to participate, 
then you've accomplished what you set out to do. Um, the, to the second point, um, sometimes we find, particularly with folks that have very small interests in property, they might not even know. You know, they might not have known before we did our research um, because uh, maybe uh, you know it was the property was their great grandfather, and then it, it aired down over time, and they didn't realize that they own a one thirty second fractional interest in this property until we did the research and told them about it. Some people may say, oh, I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm not terribly concerned about that. It's not valuable because my interest is so small. I'd be willing to give my interest to, um, to someone else in the family. And if you find that there are uh, people that are willing to do this, then uh, the, the folks that maybe have a more, uh, a larger interest in the property or that are just more interested in it uh, can try to acquire the interests of those folks that are willing to give them up. And that can be accomplished fairly easily with what's called a deed of gift, um, which is a deed, as, it, as the name implies, where a person is giving up their interest in the property without, having, without being paid for it. And so um, that person, the grantor with that, or the person making the gift could simply sign a deed of gift to transfer their interest over to another family member and thereby consolidate somewhat the ownership of the property. And depending on how successful the person engaged in this campaign is, is they may be able to actually acquire all of the interests in the property this way, or a majority of the interests in the property. And it doesn't necessarily have to be a gift. Um, there could be a person with a fractional interest, uh, say someone has 10%. They're not particularly interested in the property, but they feel like, well, I've got something here. You know, I don't want to just give it away for free. And you have another family member, maybe that owns a larger stake that owns 60% of the interest. And he says, okay, well, um, you know, I'd really like to, I'd, I'd like to get full control of this property. I'd be willing to pay you, you know, $5,000 for your 10% or whatever they decide. And in that case, um, there's, uh, it, it's certainly um, possible to have uh, a deed for consideration where a paid for deed to uh, where one person buys out that other person's interest. And so sometimes maybe through a combination of gift transfers and, and buyout um, transfers, uh, one person may be able to consolidate all or, or much of the interest in the property. Um, uh, uh, similar to my earlier comment about the quiet title action, when you have known co-ownership of property, meaning that, you know, we've done our research, um, we've, we've cleared the title in the sense that we've recorded wills or real estate affidavits to make it clear who owns the property, but the people just cannot get along, the, the folks that own the property cannot agree. Um, if one of the owners is sufficiently motivated, they can bring what's called a partition suit. And this is another court case. So again, we generally think of this as a, 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 a default or kind of a last line of defense, if you will, because it's going to be a lengthy and expensive process. But people, every co-owner, um, no matter how small your interest is, has a right to ask the court to partition the property. And that's a fairly complex procedure, but it is one that can, uh, under which the court can force the property to be either divided or to be sold so that these people who co-own it uh, no longer have to be joint owners of the property. Um, so just to give an example of how that might work, if you imagine, you know, four siblings that inherited a, a tract of land that's 20 acres, um, and they each own a one quarter interest in that 20 acres, if it's susceptible to being divided in kind through a partition suit, the court could order that they physically divide the property, um, you know, subdivide it by a plat and divide it into four pieces and then have a deed recorded that conveys one of those four pieces to each of the four people. And so the end result is instead of each of them owning a one quarter interest in the whole of the 20 acres, they each end up with five acres um, in their own 
are titled solely in their own name. Um, many properties are not susceptible to division that way. And so um, what the, the court can also do in a partition suit is to force the property to be sold. So imagine you have your four owners, but it's a house that sits on a half an acre. There's no way you can divide that house into four equal pieces. It's just, it's one, one property. And in that type of scenario, um, the, the court in a partition suit can force the property to be sold over, even if, even if some of the co-owners don't want it to be sold. Um, the court can force it to be sold. And then each co-owner would be entitled to his share of the sales proceeds through that partition suit. So again, um, partition suits are not ideal because they're lawsuits and those are more complex and expensive, but it is there as a backup when all else fails. Um, so we also, and, and we also like to think about how we can avoid some of these airship issues in addition to um, how we clean them up. And so sometimes even when we are cleaning up airship issues, um, we'll talk to the family members that are acquiring the property through that cleanup process and see if maybe they would like to engage in a little bit of planning um, so that they can hopefully avoid having these things happen in the future, um, or at least unintended divisions of the property happen in the future. And so there are some fairly common planning tools um, that are often implemented to that end. Um, and and these, these may seem obvious, but for example, if a person doesn't have a will and they're willing to make a will, um, then in their will, they can decide who's going to inherit the property from them and thereby avoid potentially having it be fractioned off to people um, that they would not have otherwise given it to. Um, there's an instrument that is called a transfer on death deed, which um, we found to be very useful in certain situations. This is a document by which the, um, an owner of property can name a, a beneficiary, uh, very similar to the way that you name a beneficiary on a bank account or on a retirement account, so that when the owner of the property dies, the property will automatically transfer to the person they've named in their transfer on death deed. Um, there are also deeds with the reservation of a life estate. So if the owner is willing to make a current conveyance of the property to actually give it away, but wants to reserve for himself or herself the right to live in the property for the rest of their life, they can do that by actually making a lifetime transfer where they deed the property to somebody else, but they reserve to themselves a life estate, which will entitle them to continue to have the property balance of their life. Um, if the owner does not, it doesn't have the need to keep ownership of the property, you know, uh, we'll often find that there's folks that are, are willing to simply give their property. So um, let's say that they have a, a child um, that maybe lives in this house and they've decided, oh, okay, well, at this point, I'm comfortable just giving it to him or her. And, um, and so they can sign a deed of gift where they transfer ownership of the property to this other person a generation down and thereby avoid having a potential issue if they had died in testate or if the property had gone to someone else. And then finally, it's, um, it, it's not, not something that folks often think about, but that is often used with deeds is, uh, is ownership, um, joint ownership with a right of survivorship. And so this is very common um, in, in marital property. So when a husband and wife own property, very frequently they'll hold title in a way that's called joint with the right of survivorship. And what that means is that when you have two people that own property that way, if one of them dies, um, the other will become the sole owner of the property um, by operation of law. And joint with the right of survivorship ownership is not limited to just husbands and wives. So, for example, if it was consistent with, um, you know, a, a parent's estate plan that they wanted their three children to own the property that way, they could, the, the parent could deed the property to their three children and make the children owners joint with the right of survivorship. And what that means is then at that next generation down, if one of those three children passes away, the other two own it automatically. It doesn't go to the estate or, or through the estate of the, 
person had died. And then if another one of them passes away, then the sole surviving um, child will own the property without it going through the second person to pass away's estate. And so that can help keep keep the property consolidated with one person or, or just a couple people. Um, I think this is displayed. We have, uh, I, I created a, a little hypothetical scenario here that talks about um, what may happen over time. And, and um, it's obviously this is completely made up, but you can see here some examples about how some of these things play out. Um, if you look where John Doe owns the property, we call it Green Acre, um, and he's married and his wife, Jane, and he has four children. Um, and then if you look where it says 1959, John Doe dies testate, um, that means that John had a will. And in this hypothetical example, his will leaves all of his estate to his wife, Jane. So when John, when John died, um, the whole of the property, 100% went to one person. So he's kept title consolidated that way um, without it being fractioned off. At that time, if John had died intestate without a will, um, the property would have passed to his four children with his wife, Jane, having um, an interest, a life estate interest in it. So instead of just one person, you would have had five different people that had interest in the property at that time if he did not have a will. So you can see how the operation of the will helped kept things consolidated. In the next, um, next line in 1962, when Jane dies, she doesn't have a will. She died intestate. And um, because one of her children, Donald, predeceased her, um, you actually end up with five people taking title. Her three living children, Arnold, Benjamin, and Catherine, each inherit their one quarter interest. But the interest of her deceased son, Donald, flows down to his uh, children, Elijah and Francis. And so they split his one fourth interest and it becomes one eighth each. So because Jane did not have a will or she did not make any lifetime transfers or make other arrangements for her interest, you now have five owners of the property of varying degrees of interest. And it's important to know that may be exactly what Jane wanted. Um, we, we shouldn't necessarily assume that that's wrong in some way, but the fact that she died without a will means we don't know. And if she had intended that maybe just one of her children inherit that property and kept it consolidated, she missed an opportunity to do that by not making a will herself. Um, and then we see again, um, uh, to give you another example, we have a, a next generation in 1995, Arnold dies. So Arnold, he only owned a one quarter interest in the property that he had inherited from his mother. And so he, he didn't own the whole thing. And then when he dies without a will, um, his three children, Gerald, Harold, and Imogene, inherit from him. And so all of a sudden, what was a one quarter interest held by Arnold is now fractioned down to one twelfth interest each held by his children. Um, in our next example in 2004, we see where Benjamin did some planning. Um, he made a transfer on death deed during his lifetime. Um, and he named his wife Janice as the transfer on death beneficiary. So his one quarter interest has remained in that status. When he dies, Janice inherits his one quarter interest and it doesn't get fractioned down. Um, I, I'll skip down to 2010. Um, we see Carl who um, had, had a one quarter interest dies without a will and he has four children. Um, and so his interest is now fractioned down to one sixteenth each amongst his children, um, Leonard, Martin, Nancy, and Orville. And so again, generation by generation, you're seeing those interests get smaller and smaller where people have taken no action to address it. Um, and then again, I'll, I'll skip down um, just to try to illustrate the point where we have Harold passing away and he only owned a one twelfth interest. So now we're three generations removed. Um, and he had no will and his three children inherit from him. And now they each have a one thirty sixth interest. 
So you can imagine that these owners, Quentin, Reggie, and Samuel, who have a 136 interest, may not be terribly motivated to participate or to do anything with the property because their interest is so small and it may not be very valuable. Um, and so that just can kind of illustrate a little bit of how these interests can get fractioned down over time and what some of the consequences can be. And also how you can avoid that through proper planning. Um, so I, I think I wanted to open up to, to questions at this point, um, if we have any. We do have one um, in the chat and you guys can feel free to add more or, or raise your hand. Um, so Elizabeth says, this is great information. Um, we frequently run into cloudy titles in our project areas. And unfortunately, our clients simply do not have the resources or time to clean up the titles. What are the legal concerns or consequences to a lien holder for filing an imperfect deed of trust? And what concerns would there be to improve a home with a cloudy title through housing rehab that would prevent a locality from issuing a building permit? Good, good question, thank you. Um, I mean, it is, I, I, I think it's important to understand that you can, uh, whether it's as a lien holder or a grantee of the property, an outright grantee of the property, you can acquire a fractional interest. So in your example, you have the, um, you have a situation where less than 100% of the owners are signing the deed of trust that secures the funder or the, the lender or the grantor of the loan um, or grant for this rehab project. And so let's just hypothetically say that the owners that signed the mortgage hold 75% of the interest in the property. What that means in effect is that the, the lender, the person secured by that deed of trust only has a lien on that 75% interest in the property. And so we don't know what the future holds, but the purpose of that lien is to secure the loan. And, excuse me, um, if nothing goes wrong, um, it, it's possible that, that this will be of little consequence at the end. If the borrowers pay the loan back, the ones that you know have a 75% interest in the property, if they do everything they were supposed to do, um, and no one disrupts their ownership during the period of their ownership and they pay back the loan and then the loan is eventually released. It may, it may be something of little consequence at the end, but the, the lender cannot step into any greater position than what they've acquired. So if things don't go smooth um, with the loan, um, you know, we don't like to think about foreclosures, but they happen sometimes. And if the lender were to foreclose on its mortgage and acquire that property, it will have only acquired the 75% interest that was granted to it under the deed of trust. Um, they, they will not acquire the interests that were not granted to them under the deed of trust. And so what you may find is that the lender now has come into a situation where they've acquired a fractional interest in the property, 75%. Um, and they co-own it with one or more other people that they have no idea who they are, or, or maybe they have an idea who they are, but they're not cooperative. Um, we wouldn't assume them to cooperate later um, when they didn't cooperate at the outset when making the deed of trust. And now that lender, um, you know, which would normally, after doing a foreclosure, would presumably sell the property to recover their loss. Um, now is in a position where they cannot marketably sell the property because they don't own 100% of the interest. And so they're confronted with difficult choices. Um, they may need to try to approach the other co-owners to see if they're willing to be bought out so they can consolidate that interest, or they may uh, need to do a partition suit in order to consolidate that interest. Or even backing up, they may have made a business decision not to foreclose. Um, because of the title issues, um, that that's something. I mean, I, I spoke of it as if as if it was a foregone conclusion that they would foreclose, but they don't have to do that. And if the the title issues mean that they decline to foreclose, um, then maybe they're not realizing some revenue that they could have otherwise achieved that way. Thanks, Andy. You're welcome. Um, Emily with Taswell, um, 
She said she used to be in commercial real estate as a paralegal in Richmond. It's dealt with some very complicated title issues and it can get really crazy. <laughs> and I think we see that on uh, this hypothetical is that it's just wild. Um, and Marion says, uh, we run into families that have filed incorrect real estate affidavits, often just listing children living when the parent dies and not including predeceased children. Please discuss the issue of invalid um, affidavits, real estate affidavits. Yeah, no, that, that's a very good point. I'm glad you mentioned it because the real estate affidavit is designed to be a simple mechanism to confirm the change of title. But the reality is, is it, it does not include really any guidance. Um, the form itself does not include really any guidance at all about what the person is doing. And so when you, if you work with a lawyer, um, then you probably, you know, are going to get some advice and some guidance. And what I mean specifically is it says to list the heirs. The, the real estate affidavit tells people to swear under oath who the heirs of this deceased person are. But in order to do that, you have to understand who the heirs would be under applicable law. And so I, I was talking earlier about at different times, the law of intestate succession has been different about who inherits property from someone. And so you can have very innocently um, a situation where a person is just trying to clean up the title. You know, they said, oh, you know, I need I need to clear the title to dad's deed. And somebody says, oh, you just to file a real estate affidavit and they go and get the form and they say, OK, I got the real estate affidavit. It says here I should put heirs. They don't know who the class of people that constitute heirs are. Um, maybe they think uh, may, maybe their dad um, had three children, but one of them predeceased him. And they think, oh, OK, well, I'll just put the two living children here and omitting the children of the of the predeceased child. Um, which they shouldn't have done. So that's an example of how somebody could innocently make an error in the, um, in the real estate affidavit. But as you've noted, um, people may intentionally make an error in it if they're trying to accomplish something uh, or, or be you know, intentionally um, blind to the reality of the situation. So if you have, say, three children who are the heirs of the, of the person that passed away, and one of them lives in the house and he thinks, oh, this is my house. I need to establish that I'm the owner of this property. So I'm just going to put my name on this real estate affidavit. I'm going to leave my brother and sister off of this thing. Then you do have a um, you do have an issue there where they've been able to put something to record that is incorrect. And so um, there's no single solution to this. Unfortunately, um, you, if you have a dispute over these things, it's likely need, going to need to be resolved in court. Um, and we talked before about a quiet title action where if I'm one of the siblings that was left off of a real estate affidavit, then I could, I could file a court case to quiet title and tell the judge, you know, I'm a co-owner in this property. He left me off the real estate affidavit. I need a court order that confirms I'm an owner of this property. Um, if there's some urgency, like let's say that the, the person that wrongfully filed the real estate affidavit is now in the process of trying to sell the property. Um, when, you, when you file a uh, quiet title action, you can also file what's called a list pendants, which is a document that gets recorded in the land records that notifies you know, the buyer or whomever is looking at the title to the property that there is a dispute here. And this needs to be sorted out before somebody's going to be able to convey clear title and thereby protect your interest. Um, depending on what the clerk will allow without having to go, without having to, go to court, the person, um, another family member that discovers that this incorrect real estate affidavit has been filed could also attempt to file their own real estate affidavit. We have had, I have been able before when we explained the circumstances to the clerk um, that, that the clerk would allow us to file a, um, a corrected real estate affidavit that properly identifies the heirs. Um, and so that's, that's another option, but we have similarly encountered a situation where the clerk will not allow it. They said the real estate affidavit is already filed, 
and so you can't file another one you'll need to go to court if you want to get that cleared up so it, that's I, I know that's not a precise answer but it depends somewhat on what the clerk will allow you to do but we have had some success filing what i would characterize as a corrected real estate affidavit and by doing so, whether you put whether you just put two in there or you put a correct one that's labeled as corrected or amended or what have you, if you get something else in record like that, then the title examiners or whoever is looking at titles in the property is going to see, okay, there's an issue here. We can't just ignore this. Um, you know, it needs to be addressed somehow. And then a transaction may force the issue to be resolved. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, we have a question from Sanji. Uh, what are the odds that the home would be sold, though, when the title is already cloudy? Then the locality files an imperfect deed of trust. So the title is cloudy. The locality files an imperfect deed of trust. So just one owner exercising control of the property. Aren't the odds that they will even clear up the title and get 100% participation to sell the home slim to none, especially in a five year lien period, which is what our lien period is. Um, if I understand correctly, he's asking about a, a voluntary sale of by, by the owners of the property, not a foreclosure of the deed of trust. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. Yeah, um, I mean, it, you're you're correct to, I mean, in, in, a, in a voluntary transaction where a person goes to sell property, and let's say they somehow mislead the, buy, the buyer, they, um, they sign a contract, what, the, the, the true facts are that three different people own the property, but one person signs a, a contract to sell the property, claiming it to be their own. The, the buyer, in, in, in almost any, you know, routine or, or standard real estate transaction, the buyer is going to have a title search done. And that title search is going to reveal the fact that this one person who signed the contract does not own 100% of the interest. And therefore, they cannot convey what they don't own. And you're, you're right, um, Sanjay, that, that you wouldn't expect that deal to go through under those circumstances either the seller is then going to have to scramble to try and get his siblings or whoever else owns the property with them to participate, or um, if they're unwilling to, it's unlikely that he's going to be able to, you know, get that resolved in time to sell the property under that context. And, and I think your point may also be that a person that was unwilling to take formal steps to do something to address the title beforehand is probably not willing to you know, file a partition suit to get it resolved um, and spend the time and money involved in that. So I, I would, I would, uh, I guess I would answer the question that it's probably relatively low that you would see an actual uh, outright sale of the property in that kind of situation. Thanks, Andy. Um, the next question is Elizabeth, which I think you answered. Uh, would you have to list a predeceased child if that child had no? heirs oh no i don't think you answered that did you i i don't think so um i i don't think we previously answered it and so the way um uh, the way the course of descent works if you have any if if the decedent and i'm talking about intestate succession if the decedent has any descendants um let, let me let me say in this hypothetical the decedent was unmarried so there's no spouse. Um, no Let's spouse say that the decedent died in infancy. Because that's the case I'm thinking of. The, 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 okay. So a household has four children and one child died in infancy. So clearly could not have had any heirs. Unless you count their, his sisters and brother. Right. Okay, right. so they well, that would be their heirs. Well, I, I guess where I'm not, I don't. No, if I understand, did the, the infancy, the person that died own the property outright? So it was No, them? let's say let's say the parents own the property. Okay. And you want to do this um real estate affidavit and you have to list all of the heirs to the person right. who owns the property. And yes. one of the children died in infancy. So right. would you still list that child even though he's deceased? Because 
or or no uh, not not in the not in the example that you just gave because okay because the deceased child has no descendants there right. is no one claiming true or under him or her and so the other three siblings that were living um are the only ones that will inherit from mom or dad whoever the, the late, later of them to pass away so the um the child that predeceased the parent takes no interest in in the hypothetical you gave. Thank you. I, I don't know if, if this is this might be too far a point, but you can have someone that owns that that let's say that that a child owned property, and then they passed away unmarried and without any descendants of their own. So they this person actually owned the property, and then when she died she had she was unmarried and she had no descendants of her own in that case the intestacy statute does have it's kind of like a family tree in which it um it declares who are going to inherit from that person who actually had an interest in the property it kind of goes up you know to the parents and then down to the siblings and then farther out you know um nieces and nephews and cousins and that kind of thing so um it, it's not uh, you have to get really far afield in the attestacy statute um, before you would have like um, a forfeiture or anything. You, you can get very remote relatives um, that could be entitled to an ownership interest. Hey, Erica, I see your question. Do you feel like it was answered when he answered Sanji or is, was there any piece that you wanted further commented on? Uh, yeah, that actually, I just want confirmation. So it is a five-year term, 0% interest, forgivable loan, the risk for filing an imperfect deed of trust on a property, it is a relatively low risk for the for the locality or the grantee, correct? Um, I, I think so. I mean, when you're assessing risk, you, you would look at the potential outcomes. And uh, with your forgivable loans, you know, people are not even making payments. Um, so, you know, under a, a routine loan where somebody's required to make payments, you have that additional risk of non-payment and, and that triggering the need to, um, uh, to foreclose and realize your security or your collateral out of the real estate. In this situation, you don't really have the expectation that any payments are going to come due. So your risk is even lower um, because of that. It's really you only are going to encounter a situation where you would where you would need to realize your collateral when the um if they I guess if they change the use of the property and they no longer qualified. So let's say they the the terms of the loan were that you only get this loan forgiveness if you live in the house and they move out and they start renting the house to you know somebody else so they no longer qualify at that time the balance of your loan is presumably going to come due under the terms of your note and you would you would say okay well that's why we have the deed of trust you know this is the situation that we're protecting against and since they're no longer qualifying for the program we're not going to give them a free ride here and let them get rent on top of a free loan and so we're going to call the note and so they owe us the balance of the notice of that time. They say, no, thank you. We don't feel like paying. And that's when you need to go and foreclose on that, foreclose on that mortgage in order to realize your, um, your collateral and turn it into money. But um, I, I don't have statistics. I, I'm assuming a lot of people in this conference may have much better statistics than I do, but I would expect that would be pretty rare um, that with the relatively short five-term loan, that people are well aware that you know a condition of this loan is that this is your home um that that it's not it's going to be exceedingly um you know rare that you're going to be foreclosing under those kind of circumstances thank you andy no i absolutely agree i think sometimes our localities are kind of worried of what the impact would be to them for doing that and i did i never had to answer before now so thank you um thank you for answering that one other question um too is since, you know, for a lot of these projects, you're making all of these projects, you're making improvements to the property. Is there any risk to a locality for issuing a building permit when there's an unclear title? Um, I don't know specific. I'm, I'm, 
uh, I, I'm sorry to not answer your question more directly, um, but I, I haven't researched the code requirements associated with um, the county code requirements associated with issuance of building permits. And so uh, just thinking of it, you know, uh, off top of mind, I think as long as the county code permits the issuance of the building permit to an owner, um, then you should be fine. Um, but if the county code requires that it be issued to all owners, then there is a potential issue there. Thank you so much. I appreciate it. That was very helpful. Okay. Um, I don't know if Jan and Abbott from York County have any comments they'd like to share. From I know that you know you guys were trying to help um, your clients go ahead and do wills while you you had Andy's services, and, and I know that that's a great idea to to prevent this um, this issue. I know Abbott looked like he was driving a bus earlier. <laughs> Well, I, I am riding on a bus, so um, no, I appreciate it. And I, I appreciate all the, the hard work that Andy does uh, with us on these projects. Um, you know, I think that it's incumbent upon us when we can to try and, and prevent these air issues from arising in the future. So that's why we really wanted to uh, incorporate the, some simple wills and some a little, you know, very light estate planning uh, in as part of, of our projects because uh, the project we're doing right now is, I mean, the entire area is all family. They are all related to each other and none of them have any intents of selling the property, but they just trying to clear it up. So it's not, I think we have 18 heirs on one piece of property um, and getting it down to a more manageable level is always the ideal, um, even though I know they want to hand it down within the family. So, um, you know, it's, it's, it's a little bit of uh, uh, extra money on our end, but not enough that in, in the grand scheme of one of these, you know, these projects are so expensive to start with. The, the cost, and Andy is phenomenal about giving us a really good rate. Uh, you know, the cost is negligible in the grand scheme of things, and I think it's just totally worth it. Um, you know, it's, these are the, the, this is the part of the project that really makes you scratch your head. And, um, you know, it, it's just, I, for anyone who's doing this on their own, I highly encourage you to get uh, get legal help because it does make life so much easier uh, having them do do their, their piece of it instead of you trying to be the one doing all the, the digging and, and, and the family research. I mean, we still uh, we still are involved. You know, we're still you know making sure that the, the affidavits are getting filled out. And we're in, there's a lot of calls that Jan is on and Jan spends countless hours working with the families too. But uh, it is definitely. Uh, in my opinion, the way to go is to have uh, outsource that as much as possible. But uh, unless uh, I'll be quiet, I don't know if Jan wants to add anything. Thanks so much, Abbott. Um, we do have more questions. As you can see, Andy, this is a very popular topic, so we really appreciate your time today. Um, Marion asked if we should verify the correctness of the real estate affidavit. Um, I, I think it's prudent to, um, you know, the, um, you're going to have a, a death certificate. By necessity, you need a death certificate for the deceased person to accompany the real estate affidavit. And that's not going to have every piece of information that, you know, is on the, uh, is on the real estate affidavit, but it is going to have data points. Um, you know, regarding their marital status and their date of death. And uh, it may have, you know, it may have by the, um, the person that provided the information. And so there's some independent verification you can do through that. Um, I would, I try to be on the lookout, so to speak, from um, things in the title. So if we've done a title search in advance, and, you know, that's the reason that we know there is a real estate affidavit. Um, it's, it's, it's told us the need for that because there's a missing link. There's often clues, even though we don't know this precise information, and that's the reason that we're getting the real estate affidavit, there may be clues in the real estate, in, in what is in the title search about other family members. So like, just for example, like you could see 
where one sibling passed away and there's already something of record, like a will of record, and, it, and that will states who his family members are. And then you have another sibling pass away and there's no record, um, but he, and you want to do a real estate affidavit for him, but because they share common family members, we know to a degree who some of those people are. And so I try to be on the lookout from the information that we do have. Um, whether or not it's squaring up with that. Um, but I don't know that, you know, when you're talking about um, these family situations, I don't know that you can independently verify every aspect of it. Um, you know, you can, you, you can uh, interview people, you can follow up leads and, and call folks and say, is this right? You know, it, does this sound like, what the, um, you know, what your knowledge of this family is. Do you know, did he have that kid or didn't have that kid? Um, so you can certainly increase the uh, amount of diligence you do to get a higher degree of certainty, but we don't generally, we don't generally go that far as to, um, you know, to start contacting people. Uh, uh, the, I mean, to be clear, the, the person signing the affidavit is swearing under oath as to the truth of the matters in a public record. And so you're, if you're going to, you know, if you're going to intentionally commit fraud and put that in a document that's going to be in the public records for anybody, you know, where anybody can find it and see it, you're really exposing yourself to a significant amount of potential liability, um, you, you know, and, and uh, punchable offense by doing so. And so I, I don't, I don't mean to be so naive that people don't, you know, commit these kinds of acts. It does happen, but I think that you, you've got to be, um, you know, you'd be taking a major risk to, to do that. And so um, I, I, sorry if I got off topic there, but I, I, the, the short answer is we don't go to the ends of the earth to independently verify the information in a real estate affidavit but we will use the information that is available to us to try and you know, check data points. And if there is a red flag that's raised, then that would, that, would man, you know, that would tell us we need to inquire further to figure out what's going on here. Thank you, Andy. Um, it looks like we're getting into questions um, about funding for this, which you probably can't answer for this. <laughs> um, Let's see, we have one more question. Amanda. Okay, Amanda's answering about the, the budget. Um, I guess I would maybe ask, I, you might not have it offhand, but if, if you have any other contacts throughout the state that provide your services that you would recommend, maybe you could provide those. Because um, I know you can't, you probably can't work for the entire state, unfortunately. <laughs> um, but um, we really appreciate your time today. I don't know if anyone else has any questions or comments, but... Um, uh, okay, we have one more. <laughs> is there a cap limit on title clearance? Oh, okay, I think this is more funny. <laughs> but anyway, we'll just um, thank you again uh, for being so gracious with your time, and we'll give you a, a virtual round of applause. And um, yeah, thank you so much. You're welcome. Lots, thank lots you. Lots of all. thank yous in the chat. Sure. Have okay. a wonderful day. Thank you. Take care. Thank you, Andy.